Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to this IOF Bondcast webinar on should we reconsider the primary, the primary prevention of osteoporosis in the light of recent evidence. I'm Dominique Pierrot, Science Manager at IOF, and I'm very happy to moderate this webinar today. Before introducing the speaker of the day, I would like to mention that attendees are automatically muted. I also would like to encourage you to ask questions during the webinar by typing your questions into the question box of the control panel. I will voice the questions to the speaker towards the end of the webinar. This, be, this being said, I'm very hon honored and pleased to introduce the speaker of the day, Professor Cyrus Cooper, president of IOF. Dr. Cooper is professor of rheumatology and director of the MRC Life Course Epidemiology Unit in Southampton and professor of epidemiology at the Nuffield Department of Orthopedics, Rheumatology and Musculoskeletal Science at the University of Oxford. Uh, Professor Cooper also leads an internationally competitive program of research into the epidemiology uh, musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal disorder, most notably osteoporosis. Professor Cooper, I'm very glad uh, that you accept to present this webinar today and we are listening to your presentation. Thank you very much. Dominique, and uh, as you said also, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to so many of you who have uh, joined from around the world. And the topic that I thought I would consider today is really the primary prevention of osteoporosis in the light of recent evidence. So what I propose to do, if uh, we move to the next slide, is uh, a historical introduction followed by consideration of the disease, the test, the intervention, and the applicability of preventive programs using uh, both primary and secondary prevention uh, to emphasize that secondary prevention is much better validated historically, but that primary uh, should come to our consideration as a result of three recent large European studies. So the historical context is clear. Osteoporosis was coined as a term in the 1850s, referring to the morphology of, of the skeleton. Uh, we developed methods of non-invasive assessment with DEXA in 1987, but really it's been a period of 20 years in which we've developed risk assessment methodology and a variety of treatments that have opened the possibility these primary preventive strategies. And in that last three decades, when we've moved from an inevitable consequence of aging to uh, risk assessment and treatment, probably the important milestone was the 1994 development of the WHO definition of osteoporosis, which placed a threshold on the continuous distribution of bone mass that is um, uh, observed throughout the population. Now, soon after the um, recognition of this continuous distribution, two broad approaches to prevention were outlined, uh, both of which are applicable. On the right-hand side here, you see the population approach in which we attempt to move the distribution in a beneficial direction for everybody. Broadly speaking, this is relatively inexpensive, it has a small impact on the incidence of disease in each patient, but has a large attributable risk in the population. And of course, randomized control trial and systematic review evidence of the effectiveness of population strategies are always difficult to find with uh, remote and relatively infrequent outcomes such as fracture. But nevertheless, we accept the broad benefits of maintenance of physical activity, optimization of diet, avoidance of tobacco and alcohol consumption. More interest, of course, in the setting of the doctor-patient relationship uh, is uh, attached to the high-risk approach. And secondary prevention is probably the 
that the best validated of these approaches, because rather than making a measurement in everybody, the presence or absence of a fracture can be used as the risk marker and intervention directed according to subsequent assessments in people who start off by being identified on the basis of a fracture. But for the purposes of today, primary prevention refers to a population screening program in which risk is assessed in the absence of knowledge of a previous fracture and on the basis of that risk which is a continuous distribution throughout the population an unacceptable threshold is defined intervention is targeted and we look at the effectiveness of the policy as a whole and screening the use of such simple tests across an apparently healthy population to identify individuals who have risk factors or early stages of disease but do not yet have symptoms came really into prominence in the 1950s when in the post-war uh, western health system settings large-scale assessments were conceived in the healthy population with the aim of preventing um, uh, rather distant in time adverse outcomes and the WHO principles and practice of screening for disease published in 1968 by Wilson and Jungner itemized the criteria for such population screening programs. The disease should be important. It should have an early asymptomatic stage moving through initial symptoms to the later outcome and its natural history should be understood. The predictive capacity of the test should be established and suitable, and the test should be acceptable to the population. In terms of the intervention, the treatments should be approved. Facilities for risk assessment should be available, as well as those for instating treatment, and there should be an agreed policy on whom to treat. And then finally, in terms of the economic considerations of the program as a whole, the whole program should be demonstrably effective. Cost utility should be competitive with other healthcare priorities. And the whole screening program should be clinically, socially, and ethically acceptable to health professionals and the public. And I hope I will show you today that many of these criteria have been met. And in particular, recent evidence suggests that some of the criteria in the fourth category are beginning to be satisfied sufficiently that we may look at implementation of primary osteoporotic fracture prevention. Now, initial approaches to screening for osteoporosis rested on the risk assessment methodology being BMD assessment by DXA. And a variety of papers in the late 90s and early 2000s suggested such primary prevention strategies. For example, the National Osteoporosis Foundation with ASBMR and a host of other societies in North America went for BMD testing for all women aged 65 years and over and younger postmenopausal women with a previous fracture or other risk factors as early as 1998. The US Preventive Services Task Force in 2002 endorsed the screening strategy of all women aged 65 years and over and women at higher risk aged 60 years and over on the basis of low body mass index and no previous use of menopausal hormone therapy. And then in a follow-up in 2011, that advice was endorsed by the uh, PSTF in the United States, but they accepted that there was no direct scientific evidence supporting screening and the feasibility and cost effectiveness uh, were at that time uncertain. Many countries opted rather than going for mass screening with BMD assessment in some period around the menopause or in the 10 or 15 years after, many countries opted to use bone densitometry or clinical indications in which knowledge of the test result would lead to a clinical decision by the physician looking after the individual patient. 
And in the UK, the um, Royal College of Physicians guidance was very much in that vein, as indeed was earlier guidance produced by the ASBMR and um, for a variety of other countries around Europe. The next point illustrated on the right hand side in this historical um, uh, narrative was the development of a risk assessment tool that provided an alternative to simple measurement of BMV. And that was the FRAX tool, which was developed by John Canis and his groups uh, in 2008 and which provided a basis for um, risk assessment that incorporated DXA but only after a number of other clinical attributes were evaluated. And we'll come to its performance characteristics uh, in a later part of the webinar. So then the disease, it's quite clear that the descriptive epidemiology of the disease and its burden in the population is substantial. Uh, the most recent report in the largest six EU countries will soon be supplemented by a follow-up scope report undertaken by IOF, uh, which will endorse the burden of the disease and provide up-to-date data beyond the 2010 findings, which have been previously published. In the Broken Bones, Broken Lives report, osteoporosis was found to affect 2.8 million women in the UK and 0.7 million men. Um, the prevalence, 21.8% of women aged 50 years and above, and 6.8% of men aged 50 years and above. Uh, data were available for the disease associate, disability associated life years lost per 1,000 people in the population in the top right. For the annual fracture related costs in the country, uh, bottom right, and for the lifetime risk of fractures at different sites in women and men in each of these six countries. The UK data shown here are simply an example of the wealth of information in this report, which has recently just been published in um, the archives of osteoporosis. The impact of these fractures is broadly speaking, a cumulative risk of one in two women and one in five men above the age of 50. Um, caseloads in Europe shown here, adding up to a total of three and a half million fractures each year at a cost of 39 billion euros. And I won't labor the hospitalization and mortality impact, but those are well understood. And the natural history of bone mass change throughout the life course, the gain up to skeletal maturity soon after the end of linear growth, the subsequent slow rates of loss in men and women, superimposed on which are the accelerated loss in women over the decade following the menopause and the various factors which influence peak and loss rate. Going back to the test. So if one compares for each quartile change in risk factor, in this slide, BMD in red, blood pressure in dashed light blue and cholesterol in black, and of course, the directions are for declining quartile of BMD, rising quartile of blood pressure, and rising quartile of fasting serum cholesterol, you see the risk gradients for the outcomes linked to these uh, risk factors. Fracture for BMD, stroke for blood pressure, and myocardial infarction for cholesterol. And certainly the relationship between BMD and fracture is commensurate with that for blood pressure and stroke and substantially steeper uh, than that between cholesterol and myocardial infarction. And those two are worth looking at because for both of them, blood pressure and cholesterol, uh, population primary preventive strategies are currently widely espoused in many healthcare systems. Uh, the opportunistic approach in the Royal College of Physicians guidelines uh, came into being in the late 1990s, as I mentioned, and was taken up well amongst general practitioners and hospital consultants in the UK, but unfortunately did not, not meet the cost effectiveness threshold in, in, in terms of the cost per quality adjusted life year saved that was customary for approved healthcare interventions. Uh, nevertheless, 
the introduction of FRACS led to a national guideline utilizing uh, thresholds of 10 year probability of major osteoporotic fracture, um, clinical risk factors in FRACS coupled with bone densitometry. Uh, indicator levels for the measurement of bone density shown in yellow in the central uh, panel showing the NOG um, guidance, and uh, indicator sections in red for treatment and in green for lifestyle advice were delineated and are, now, and are now widely accepted, not just in the UK, but in a variety of um, European and international um, osteoporosis guidelines. In a systematic review of intervention thresholds based on FRACs uh, from four years ago, more than 120 guidelines have used the risk assessment methodology, and in, in, at the recent count, it's over 140. Uh, in 58 of these, a fixed intervention threshold was, uh, was utilized with variable incorporation of BMD, and in 24, an age-dependent intervention threshold, just as shown in the NOG panel of the last slide uh, was adopted. And of course, the 58 broadly follow the National Osteoporosis Foundation recommendations in the United States. The performance characteristics of any risk assessment tool include its discriminative capacity and its calibration. The, the discrimination is the ability of the tool to distinguish high and low risk individuals. The calibration, the ability to identify incident fracture cases. For discrimination, you can see the gradients of risk for BMD alone, clinical risk factors alone, and for the combination of the two. And you can see that that capacity to distinguish high and low risk is optimal for hip fracture and for other osteoporotic fractures for the combination of the risk factors with DXA. And in terms of calibration, I use the Leslie's data from a decade ago now, showing that for FRAX with and without BMD, the FRAX predicted a 10-year fracture probability really closely approximates to the observed 10-year fracture probability. And there are several other sets of data since that um, initial observation, which endorse the calibration characteristics. So in terms of the test performance, it performs certainly well enough to warrant its incorporation in putative uh, screening approaches. And ideally, it is placed within the context, DXA is placed within the context of the FRAX clinical risk factors, and it's the tool as a whole that has been subjected to evaluation. So now let's turn to recent data on the intervention. So in the uh, most recent European guidance for diagnosis and management of osteoporosis, uh, the guidance was published in Osteoporosis International last year. We see the oral and intravenous bisphosphonates, uh, denosumab, and a variety of other agents that have been um, demonstrated to be effective against osteoporotic fracture. And this year, these were also joined by remesozumab uh, in both the FDA, EMA, and other judgments around the world. So how do we incorporate this information on the disease, the test, and the intervention into evaluation of primary prevention? So the first study I'm going to tell you a little bit about is the SCOOP trial. Uh, this was published a couple of years ago in The Lancet, and subsequent papers to the main findings have been published through uh, the period since then. It was led by Lee Shepstone and colleagues um, in the University of East Anglia, and of course, uh, John Canis, Eugene McCluskey, uh, Nick Harvey, and a host of other collaborators were involved in the study. It included women aged 70 to 85 years, um, who were identified from primary care listings in seven geographic regions of the United Kingdom. These were randomly allocated to usual care or to an intervention arm, which was based around screening using the FRAX tool. And in those subjects deemed to be at high risk of fracture on the basis of either the clinical risk factors alone 
or the clinical risk factors supplemented with bone densitometry. Um, anti-osteoporosis medication was recommended to the GP and follow-up was undertaken at six monthly intervals for five years with the principal endpoint being major osteoporotic fracture, uh, but others including hip fracture, mortality and or fractures. As you know, there was a 28% reduction in hip fracture risk in the screening arm compared with the control arm over the five years of observation. Uh, the difference between the two arms became apparent at around the second year of uh, follow-up and progressively maintained its distance from year three to year five. It's important to note that there were non-significant um, differences between the two arms, um, uh, a reduction but only to 0.94 with the upper confidence limit going to 1.03 for osteoporosis-related fractures, 0.94 with estimates of confidence between 0.86 and 1.03 for any clinical fracture, uh, the significant effect that I've just shown you for hip fracture, and uh, death um, risk, which was 1.05, uh, with bracketing from 0.93 to 1.19. The tool itself performed as we would have wanted it to. Here you see for quintiles of 10-year probability by fracs, the actually observed incidence rates of osteoporotic fractures and of hip fracture, and you can see that these rise smoothly in each category with the baseline predicted 10-year hip fracture probability. And it was the FRAX hip fracture probability that was used as the decision-making tool in uh, the SCOOP trial. When we looked at the different FRAX risk factors and their impact on the effectiveness of screening, uh, in a paper that was published in JBMR uh, by Eugene and a follow-up cost-effectiveness study uh, by David Turner, we saw that effects of screening were found to be significantly positive in people with previous fracture, parental hip fracture. There was no interaction, but uh, an effect on glucocorticoid users, alcohol users, rheumatoid arthritics and secondary osteoporotics, but the significant interaction terms for risk factor modifying the effectiveness of screening was observed for previous fracture, parental hip fracture and smoking. And I'll come back to previous fracture and show you the purely secondary fracture component of the story uh, when I talk about secondary prevention. We found a significant effect of baseline fracs on the impact of the SCOOP screening program. And this was really the centerpiece of Eugene's manuscript in the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research in 2018. So that as you would expect and hope to see, the higher baseline probability of hip fracture by fracs, the greater was the difference between the screening arm and the control arm, expressed as the distance between the diagonal solid line and the horizontal line uh, at a hazard ratio of one. And the um, impact of this, um, of this interaction was statistically significant, uh, something that is not often seen for um, statistical interactions at a p-value of 0.021. We published just earlier this year that the impact of knowledge of future fracture risk on GP prescription behavior was profound. And the translation of this into uh, adherence with therapy was also substantial. Here you see at 6, 12, 24, 36, and 48 months in the um, analysis of the SCOOP participants after randomization that the individuals in the high risk category of the intervention arm had really very high rates of anti-osteoporosis medication prescription, um, over 75% at six months, 
and these were maintained and increased uh, up to close to 90 percent over the period of the trial. And these were in marked distinction to the prevalences of AOM use in the low-risk individuals, which was less than 5% uh, in the first year, and stayed less than 10% at all the different points of observation, and the control arm, which also only got to just over 10% by the fourth year follow-up. So that knowledge of risk using FRACs translates into greater use and greater adherence with anti-osteoporosis medication, which was principally um, oral bisphosphonates in this particular study based in the UK. And lastly, what about cost effectiveness? So in the first analysis of cost, cost effectiveness, the Turner paper in JBMR in 2018, we found really quite low costs shown in the red panel per averted hip fracture and per quality gain. You know, 2,200 per quality gain puts this well below the 20 or 30,000 pounds per quality threshold that's adopted by the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence uh, in the UK as a general rule for healthcare interventions that are cost effective. And in a recent further um, health economic analysis of the data, um, Soros Cog and colleagues in John Canis's group have shown a cost saving of around 286 pounds per 1,000 women uh, screened. So this really has um, a, a, a very um, favorable uh, incremental cost effectiveness ratio as an intervention. If you want to look at the components of those costs, you can see those here in UK pounds for the identification of eligible patients, the resources to administer a screening questionnaire, the bone densitometry component, the final fracture risk result, and the GP consultation. And at £104 estimated at the cost per individual screen, uh, it really does appear uh, quite competitive. Now let's set this in context of the two other studies. One, the ROSE trial in Denmark, and the other, the SOS trial in the Netherlands. So the ROSE trial was also published in late 2018 in Osteoporosis International. There were 34,000 women living in southern Denmark who were randomized, and the primary comparison between the screened and control group was supplemented by per-protocol analyses going through the algorithm that you see down to those 9,000 with FRACs and uh, of the FRACs high-risk people, those that ended up with DXA scanning um, who were 5,009 in number. And, and the overall findings of the ROSE trial were uh, on the intention to treat look uh, found to be negative for major osteoporotic fracture, hip fracture, and all fractures. So that's in the intention to treat top um, set of, 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 of three lines. Uh, but it was based on the mailed questionnaire randomization to screening versus control. And as you can see, there was little evidence of an effect. But of course, that wasn't the feeding through of the high and low risk individuals. The risk stratification actually happened at the FRAX and BMD levels. And you can see here how the positivity of the results emerges as you move down to per protocol one and per protocol two. And for the per protocol one level, which was FRAX screening versus control, you already see hazard ratios of 0.82 adjusted for hip. And by the time you get to per protocol two, which was the FRAC screening that also had DEXA and were above 15% 10-year um, uh, risks, that then gave you a hazard ratio of 0.74, which on its own was significant at a P of 0.02 after adjustment and unadjusted was significant, as you can see, 
at a P of 0 0.007. So that there's a, there's a differential interpretation possible of this trial just on its own. The SOS study in the Netherlands, uh, which time does not uh, give me chance to, um, to go through in detail today, also reported uh, negative findings, but uh, helpfully, the authors of that study undertook a recent meta-analysis bringing together the ROSE, the SCOOP, and the SOS trials. And that was really encouraging, with the overall hazard ratio of hip fracture 0.8, with confidence limits from 0.71 to 0.91, and for even major osteoporotic fracture, uh, a hazard ratio of 0 0.91, uh, confidence limits from 0 0.84 to 0 0.98. Both of these significantly different from one. And the conclusion of that meta-analysis, notwithstanding the rather cooler conclusions of the SOS study on its own, were that consideration should really be given to implementation of primary preventive strategies utilizing uh, FRAX methodology and uh, targeting the uh, anti-osteoporosis medications that we currently have, but perhaps aiming at groups of women who are older than those that we conventionally uh, would have thought about at the menopause and up to age 65. So really this has moved to the 70 to 84 year old women uh, from uh, the younger groups considered 10, 20, and 30 years ago. In closing, let me just mention that secondary fracture prevention has, of course, been better validated in some senses and certainly more widely accepted as one of the low hanging fruit for osteoporotic fracture prevention in terms of uh, healthcare systems and strategies. So at the uh, IOF, we incepted Capture the Fracture, which started over the last 10 years in establishing the best practice framework for setting up such services uh, and iterated all of the FLS uh, services that have been put together in different parts of the world. And as you can see here, these incorporate over 400 different services in nearly 50 countries with over 350,000 fragility fractures seen uh, each year. The tools available in that um, Capture the Fracture framework um, include uh, a mentorship program that has been led by uh, the, uh, Kasim Javed and his colleagues, um, Christine Axon and the, um, and the Fracture Working Group uh, Executive Committee. Uh, the best practice framework that I alluded to with 13 ideal um, quality characteristics of a fracture liaison service, a benefit calculator to allow the health economic impact of such FLS services to be characterized, capture the fracture and FLS toolkits and slide kits, the webinar program, and the global patient charter that's been signed up to by many hundreds of um, stakeholders from patients through to uh, physicians, policymakers, national societies, and even uh, international uh, groupings of these. National registries have been a really important facilitator of secondary fracture prevention, and this is really just the history of the UK National Hip Fracture Database, which has now more recently been accompanied by a UK National FLS database, and that allows quality criteria to receive reimbursement from healthcare authorities. But really the effectiveness of secondary prevention has come more from natural experiments and complex intervention studies than from randomized controlled trials. A good example of a natural experiment would be this that we undertook in the United Kingdom. What happens when you put out national guidance to suggest secondary fracture prevention, you can see here that that introduction was attended by a relative decrease in the incidence of second fractures following an initial hip fracture. 
And accompanying that uh, decrease was an increase in use of anti-osteoporotic medication. But the SCOOP trial gives us an opportunity to look at secondary prevention in a randomized controlled trial setting. And here you see in data that were presented only last week at the Bone Research Society in the UK, the impact of the SCOOP analysis post hoc in just those women aged 70 to 85 who had had a previous fracture. And you can see here an almost identical reduction in the risk of major osteoporotic fracture, a hazard ratio of 0.73, as was observed in the trial as a whole in just those women. So that although the primary objective of the SCOOP trial together with ROSE and SOS was to evaluate primary screening, you know, in people regardless of previous fracture or not. Uh, further examination of the SCOOP data provides even better randomized control trial evidence that validates secondary fracture prevention. So where will that whole story go? So we've just recently at IOF instated the Capture the Fracture Partnership. This is an extension of our long-running CTF program undertaken in collaboration with Amgen and UCB, as well as uh, through an academic link between the IOF and the University of Oxford. Um, the, the components of this include extension of the mentorship program in a step change way, give me, um, policy development and uh, introduction of policymakers to a standardized policy program for prevention of osteoporotic fracture. The national coalitions, based on the unique Committee of National Societies that's headed up by Johnny Vrijinsta and Famida Jiwa uh, in the IOF. Scalable solutions, which really represent the development of the benefits calculator and its, uh, and its um, extension to effectively provide a cost utility evaluation of post-fracture care systems throughout the, um, th 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 throughout the world where data are available on fracture incidence, impact and costs. And finally, a digital tool which allows an international record to be maintained of secondary fracture prevention strategies. Uh, we're absolutely delighted with this innovative extension into post-fracture care, which we view as the umbrella collective term for, um, for components of secondary prevention, such as the FLS, orthogeriatric initiatives, fall prevention strategies, and so forth. And this post-fracture care extension to capture the fracture partnership uh, is one which has started over the last three months and will continue for at least the next two years. And we really look forward to uh, enrolling your assistance in transforming this particular uh, aspect of osteoporosis care uh, for, the, for the good uh, worldwide. So, prioritization of fragility fracture prevention in national policy and primary fracture prevention for individuals at high risk have been two of the known gaps in previous um, uh, records of treatment gap in bone health. I hope that I've shown you data that suggests that primary fracture prevention should become a real consideration in developing our strategies. We've already made secondary prevention a centerpiece of our, of our efforts, and I think now the challenge to us in terms of implementation and development of healthcare systems is to put in place similar um, such models for primary prevention to those that I've shown you in secondary prevention and thereby lead to step changes and 25 to 40 percent reductions are really quite legitimate objectives uh, in this growing non-communicable disease problem. So to summarize, the population and individual burden attributable to osteoporotic fracture is established. Risk assessment is well validated to, through FRACS and widely incorporated in international treatment guidelines. 
you are, of course, welcome to talk to me about a whole host of other um, risk assessment methodologies that can be utilized. And of course, there's no one size fits all necessarily, but FRAX is certainly the most rigorously put together of these tools and the most widely adopted and the one for whom calibration and discrimination have been shown uh, most, uh, most um, in, in greatest detail. Uh, the effectiveness of FRAX-based programs for treatment targeting, targeting are now demonstrable and they are remarkably, surprisingly, cost-effective. The MRC SCOOP trial has been uh, the initiative that I've been personally involved in, but the incorporation of data on SCOOP with that from ROSE and SOS really does suggest very encouraging uh, results. Mass screening strategies in women aged 70 to 85 years need to be reconsidered as they appear to be cost effective as well as um, uh, biologically effective. And these should accompany our secondary preventive strategies, which are already well designed, widely available, and must now move to the level of transforming health policy in a step change manner. I'd just like to wish you all well, to thank you very much for your time, to thank all my colleagues in these various studies, and of course, to thank IOF for hosting this GoToWebinar program. Uh, I would, I would uh, really encourage you all to join us at the World Congress virtual that's to be held from the 20th to the 22nd of August, um, uh, and, and hear more about the exciting developments in osteoporosis and fracture prevention. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Professor Cooper, for your excellent talk and for covering primary and secondary prevention of osteoporosis and fractures. I'm sure our audience really enjoyed your lecture. And now I would like to move on to questions as we have received many of them during the presentation. And maybe I will start with this first uh, question. Uh, in secondary uh, prevention, how is imp how important is DEXA scanning or FRAX score calculation? And will that affect the treatment you are going to prescribe to the patient? I think that the I, I think that the answer to this question is easiest considered by going way back to the Hawaii osteoporosis study that Phil Ross and colleagues um, published in, I think, the Annals of Internal Medicine in about 1991. But basically, that was the first time that we looked at the predictive capacity of age, of previous fracture, and of BMD separately. And each of the three of them independently contributed to fracture risk and did so in an incremental manner so that age becomes a very important component of the answer to the question that your questioner just asked. There are ages in which your calculations would suggest that on odds, treatment is so likely to be indicated in the context of a previous fracture that you might as well make that the treatment criterion. And that age typically in European populations is around 75 to 80. So above age 75, one would be forgiven, uh, or above age 80, say, one would be forgiven in the context of a previous fracture to, uh, if, if, if cost and convenience of, of access to DEXA were not the issue, one would be forgiven for instating treatment rather than not. But there's no doubt even at those ages, that the, the DXA adds even greater predictive capacity. So that although you could take the shortcut and treat age 75 plus with a previous fracture, or say two fractures if you wanted to even further increase the risk, there's no getting away from the fact that if you have easy access to bone densitometry and the patient is fit for bone densitometry, that you'll enhance the risk prediction even further with that DXA scan. Below that age, it's quite clear that there's a sufficient number of uh, false positives, if you like, that might not benefit from treatment, that the, that the addition of adjunctive bone densitometry to, to um, a history of fracture seems a much more appropriate 
use of resources. Thank you for this comprehensive answer. There is another question related to exercise. Um, so the person is asking whether you have considered how FLS or other screening initiative can influence participation of patients in exercise and how you can include tools to support implementation of osteoporosis exercise guidelines. Yeah, so this is a bit right. So in, in a way, the integration of that science that you're asking about has not been completely undertaken in osteoporosis services. It's begun to be started in things like the services for frail elder people, which focus on um, prevention of falls and incorporate within them the occupational therapeutic um, uh, evaluation, balance training, resistance training for sarcopenia and so on, as well as the bone health component that we've been talking about. But the real um, change in exercise utilization will come from taking lessons on behavior change from the health psychology world, using methods to promote um, esteem, to self-esteem, control, health efficacy. I mean, there are strategies. I mean, the one that we use in some of our research is called uh, a healthy conversation skills package, which are really quite simple peer-led interventions that entail the confidence giving to the patients to undertake such interventions. And I think building those into these kinds of programs is actually a challenge which we have yet to uh, rise to. It's a really good question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, another very important one. Uh, how should policymakers position primary care strategy with secondary prevention? Which one is the most important? I think that that's a, a very good question indeed. And there's no doubt today that it would we would be making a mistake if we ignored secondary prevention by simply focusing on primary prevention. That no question that would be an erroneous judgment. But I think that the potential for extension of secondary prevention to primary prevention actually serves as an added incentive to the policymaker to embrace the secondary prevention as the starting point. And that's what all of the Capture Fracture Partnership is about. How do you do that policy piece? How do you encourage uh, investment in this area of healthcare as compared with many of the other competing demands in NCD and cancer and infectious disease and so on? So, so, so secondary remains probably the greatest dividend at a given amount of investment, but the primary might in the end yield a greater fracture risk reduction. And we're at the stage now where we ought to be thinking about how to implement primary within routine data, data gathering systems. Put it in computing system, have the risk assessment translate into the therapeutic intervention in an automated way using the electronic health record. Um, those are the sorts of areas that we would we would really like to extend the primary story in. But I think that there would there would not be a circumstance in which I would restrict um, uh, the importance of the secondary just to promote the primary. Thank you. Uh, another question for our global audience. Uh, the different measure you presented for the prevention of osteoporosis, uh, is that depending upon ethnicity, could that be applicable for non-Caucasian uh, people, for example? So I think, I, I, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the important thing is knowing the performance characteristics of the risk assessment tool and the background epidemiology of fracture and mortality in the ethnic group concerned. And so in parts of the Asia Pacific region, in Latin America, there are clearly um, places where fracture incidence rates are different, 
or cause mortality rates are different, and maybe um, risk uh, risk assessment methodologies show differing uh, differing sort of gradients of risk for fracture. Whatever those characteristics are found to be, unless the tool were unable to prevent fracture, and we have not found a population in which previous fracture did not predict fracture and in which BMD did not predict fracture. Even if one goes to some of the um, parts of the world where uh, fracture incidence rates are really low, I mean, in Louis Solomon's studies in the Johannesburg Bantu, where rates were among the lowest that were ever recorded, metacometry predicted fracture incidence. So, you know, we've not found an, a, a population in which th there isn't predictive capacity, but the, but the risk benefit dividend return is going to vary um, in those different populations according to fracture incidence. Greatest saving will be in those places where the fracture incidence rates themselves are greatest. Okay, many thanks for this answer. There is another one related to genetic testing. Uh, the person is asking whether there is a role for genetic testing in predicting the first or the recurrent fracture. Yeah, it's a really good question. These are great questions today. So, so there's a paper, I don't know if it's just come out or it's just about to come out, looking at how a kind of genetic risk score built up from the GWAS that was undertaken, both uh, from Andre Utalinden's original Gina Moss and GFOS that went into Carol Estrada's analyses and so on, uh, and the UK Biobank. And this has come from McGill, from Brent and his team in liaison with the Rotterdam team. But, but the bottom line of, of the story is that such a risk score does predict fracture. Now, the extent to which it does so and how well it might be operationalized in some kind of routine practice is an open one. And also the prediction of the intermediaries. So if it links to fracture risk, how does it link to fracture risk? And does it do so through um, you know, the intermediary of quantitative ultrasound that's been measured in some studies through DEXA or through some other um, hitherto unidentified route? Those remain important questions, but nevertheless, it does represent a stepping stone in the translation of all of the genetic information that's led to new drugs to actually become part of um, sort of clinical practice. So I think that's a research area in which there could be dividends, but up to now, we don't sort of have DNA sent to the lab helping us in our clinical decision-making today. Perfect. Um, so coming back to the scoop data and uh, the different uh, yeah, data in the three countries, uh, how do you interpret the different findings in uh, the UK, Denmark and the Netherlands? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult and I haven't sort of um, sat down and poured over them with the investigators. I think it is worthwhile thinking about an individual patient database meta-analysis. And you may have seen the letter that um, Eugene, uh, John, and Nick wrote in response to the meta-analysis, uh, almost suggesting, if I remember rightly, that the, that, that the, um, that the better meta-analysis would be a combination of rows with um, SCOOP without SOS. But what, what, whatever the case, the short answer would be that in the rows per protocol, you sort of replicated what happened in SCOOP a little bit better because you got towards that DXA group, which had the FRAX risk factors, whereas the intention to treat just left large numbers of patients for whom uh, nothing happened. You know, there was no treatment decision on the basis of risk uh, that had to be made. In the, in the SOS study, the difficult problem was the risk assessment methodology itself. It was almost that how, how you constructed a FRAX in, 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 in that study was, was the, the issue. And that seemed to be sort of 
a construct which was not completely clear. Now, that, that's not to say that the three are not comparable. I mean, personally, I'm very comfortable with the meta-analysis that's been published. I mean, I think the thing I'd like to see, that's a group-level group meta-analysis. I'd like to see an IPD meta-analysis. That would just give us a little bit more statistical power. I don't think that the trials are so different that you can't compare them and lump them to some degree. But those are the issues about the rows and the SOS in terms of differing from the scoop. But my, my own personal view is actually that the similarities between them, given what I've just said, are actually remarkable as compared with the differences between them. Thank you. And uh, may, another question. Uh, can you speak a bit uh, or elaborate a bit about uh, patients uh, who are uh, so, who can have uh, who can be at imminent high risk of fracture? Of course I can. I mean, that's of, course, that's of course the subject of another webinar, but, but broadly speaking, we need some way of dealing with those people, especially now that, I mean, I don't know who the questioner is, but if you come from one of the lucky countries where you can actually scribble out a script for Romosozumab and there's a, a remote chance that the patient will get it, this becomes a very important question for you. So um, in, the, in that setting, uh, the early and early here relates to minimum period six months, maximum period two years, and likeliest period fracture within the last year, right? So if you've had a recent fracture, your risk goes very high. Your hazard ratio may, may go up to the fourfold, fivefold, sixfold before sinking down to an asymptotic twofold um, after that couple of years has passed. So, you know, you're at very high risk soon after you've had your first fracture. Now, how do you target those people? How do you characterize that very high risk or imminent risk? So we published um, a, an approach that's very simple using the current um, NOG charts and looking at the upper um, therapeutic threshold uh, the one where you'd automatically treat, it's the sort of 95% confidence interval to the upper line, and that seemed as good an indication for um, sort of sanctioning uh, Romosozumab, given the current tools we have at our disposal. There are other initiatives which have used, you know, pharmacoeconomic and um, uh, primary care recording data systems to generate alternative um, methods for characterizing imminent risk. And of course, if you just work backwards and see what is the 10-year risk of an osteoporotic fracture that complies with current NICE guidance in the UK for giving a teriparatide, that is about 40%, you know, over 10 years for a major osteoporotic fracture. So, so you know, you can, you can take your pick, but that easy use of the NOG picture with the upper line being the one for the highest risk and the, the, the place where you'd target your uh, Romo or teriparatide for soon after a fracture seems easy to operationalize at the moment and is available and referenceable. Thank you. And I think it's time to conclude. I'm sorry, but uh, uh, we don't, unfortunately, we don't have time to answer to all of them. But many thanks uh, for all your questions. Um, I would like to thank you all for your participation in this webinar. We hope that you enjoyed this session. We will post the recording of this webinar on the IOF website, and you will also receive the link to the recording by email tomorrow. You will be prompted to fill in a survey immediately after this webinar. We would appreciate your input and comments as we continuously try to deliver webinars that meet your needs. Last but not the least, if you have any questions, comments, please do not hesitate to send them over to webinar at iofbonehealth.org. And on behalf of IOF, I would like to thank once again Professor Cooper for his outstanding presentation. And I wish everybody a nice day, a nice afternoon, or a nice evening. Goodbye to everybody.